represents everything that all Americans want to stand for. He was a winner. He was a leader of men. An officer and a gentleman. Man of honor. Everything I ever wanted to be. Ultimate player, the ultimate person. God, country, flag wrapped into one. True American hero. Number 12 is the quarterback, Roger Stauffer. He is Captain America. You're going to be a football player. Today is the best day of your life. Believe me. He might be the finest quarterback produced in the last 10 years. He needs a day like That's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life. I didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. The rest of your life, nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it. Ready to go? Yes, sir. This feels a lot bigger now than it used to be, you know? Cause you're a sky, cause you're a sky full of stars. I'm gonna give you my heart. Thanksgiving is a, is a special day for him, as it is for all of us. It's an opportunity to be with your family. But it's a special day for him because he gets to play quarterback again. Try that again, Jeff. Zip, hut. Roger goes out there at 72 and runs the offense and manages his people and, and wins. See what Staubach has up his sleeve. Roger Staubach has always been a star. The man whose very name evokes the heavens wore the star as the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys in the 1970s. It's the most highly visible position in all of sports. It's like being the center fielder for the New York Yankees. Roger is the reason that it is that way. All of us quarterbacks who've come in since Roger, we've been playing catch up, trying to live up to an image and to a position that he helped create. He's led a hero's life, a remarkable journey filled with twists and turns that almost didn't happen because of a simple eye test. We were taking our physicals for the Naval Academy. It's the dot test. It was the red over green, green over white. You know, I missed a few, and the guy that was doing the test wasn't paying that much of attention. And so he passed me. The only time I've ever passed a color test. I mean, if I hadn't passed the test, I don't think I would have got in the Naval Academy, and my life would have changed dramatically. Eventually, the colorblind kid from Cincinnati arrived in Annapolis. And in 1962, with President Kennedy watching, he delivered an eye-popping performance in the Army-Navy game. Phenomenon of the day is Roger Stombach. Just watch this game of hare and hounds. Stombach twists and turns, faints and fakes to avoid Army tacklers. He hadn't started until maybe halfway through the year. So this was the, really the first big national audience. He was just awesome that day. Just clearly put the team on its back. Roger Stombach puts on a great one-man show. Watch him go. Stombach stardom gave Navy head coach Wayne Harden and PR man Bud Tallman, an idea for the following season, to wage what many consider to be the first Heisman Trophy campaign. I knew after that game that we had something pretty special, and, and Wayne, Wayne wanted to be sure that Roger got the attention that he deserved. And so I would collect quotes from the previous game, newspapers, opposing coaches, and I would circulate those quotes, this one-page sheet called Everything's Coming Up Roger. Tallman's goal was to make the country aware of Staubach's greatness. Back in Annapolis, the young son of a Navy assistant coach already knew how special Staubach was. I did get to know him pretty well. Roger was kind of one of the first guy on the field, last one off type of guys, so sometimes, you know, I was the only one left to throw to, and he'd throw to me. Every time you saw him play, you think, well, Man, he'll never be able to do that again. That was an amazing play. And then the next week, you see one and shake your head and say, oh my God, that was, that, that was even more spectacular than the one he made last week. I was the center on offense. Roger's back there going like this. You see the guy, you block your guy. Then you see him coming over, you block this guy. And then you do it on this way, you're blocking this guy. And, and uh, so it was fun to be a lineman for Roger Staubach. A couple of those scrambles that he made, if you freeze-framed it, 
when three guys are right around him, you would just say, there's just no way he's going to get out of that. Ron Dibonacher brings the crown to its feet. Probably the best coaching job I ever did was not coaching. I found out the best plays we had were not in the playbook. <laughs> On the football field, Staubach was a stallion that couldn't be caught. Off it, he was even harder to corral. Very rarely did I actually talk to the press. You know, I, I, mean, I was uncomfortable with it all. I, I just wanted to get out there and, and play. We had a Heisman candidate that nobody could talk to. That was unbelievable. I mean, as you think back 50 years later, you say to yourself, how on earth did we pull that off? Somehow, they did. And in the fall of 63, Staubach graced the covers of Sports Illustrated and Time Magazine. One thing, there's no face mask on this picture. In those days, we wanted people to be able to see their face, so we never put the face mask on. But he says, I look like a wimp. He still is angry about me about 50 years later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've had so many people. I mean, I have pictures, Navy pictures. That, you didn't have a face mask when you were playing? And I said, no, it was Bud Tallman. He wanted to take these pictures without a face mask. <laughs> Staubach was no longer just a face in the crowd. But even as his fame grew, he proudly displayed an unwavering commitment to his teammates. We had this little signal that, of waving to each other, just kind of going like that. If you saw somebody far away and he couldn't hear you, you'd just kind of go like Oh, yeah, yeah, waving to the guys. And he told us he was going to do that on the Ed Sullivan show. So I'm going to go like this. And uh... <laughs> Navy quarterback star Roger Staubach from Cincinnati, Ohio, the greatest in Navy history, so let's have a wonderful ovation. Some people watching it might not have seen, but we were just all there going, he did it <laughs> on national TV. I never dreamed that anything like this would happen to me. The team went out and did their best for me to get that trophy. I can remember to this day, Roger saying, I wish I could cut this trophy up into 44 pieces and give one day a piece to each of you guys. And I just wish I could divide it up into 44 pieces and give each one one of those pieces. We had a reunion at the Air Force game, 50th year reunion. They're still asking where the Heisman piece is. We always kid him every time we get together. Hey, I've never got my piece of that trophy. <laughs> His teammates still recall what he said more than 50 years ago. But perhaps the most unforgettable words spoken that night came from Roger's father. I remember, like it was yesterday, my dad was in the beginning of a health decline, so he didn't want to say anything to dinner, but they, they asked him to say something. He just said, hey, uh, God gave us uh, one child, and he gave us a good one. So that was, and he walked off, that was it. <laughs> Clearly, Roger Staubach had passed his father's eye test with flying colors. Coming up. It's not a good feeling at all, you know, you work all week and you put all that armor on on a Sunday afternoon and when you come back, you don't have to take a shower. I'll tell you, man, that's frustrating. The Heisman, it's a big trophy. Our other house, we, we had it on our mantle, and the kids used to, I mean, they were real little, so they kind of rode it like a hobby horse. <laughs> we had pictures of them sitting on the thing, you know, and uh, so, yeah, we didn't know what to do with it. Football would have to wait for Roger Staubach. Though he was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys in 1964, the Navy graduate first had to fulfill four years of military service. It is Ensign Roger Staubach now, and he's quarterbacking a team of local workers at a Navy supply depot in Da Nang. Do you miss the old days? I miss, I miss football a great deal. Yes, I do. But I, I do enjoy the Navy, and I uh, have a big job over here, and I'm going to do that, and uh, that's the most important thing right now. Wherever he was, I used to have to send him boxes of footballs. I don't know how they could wear out so many, and I asked, where are all these balls going? And he said, well, we had a, a, a bunch stored in this tent about 100 yards from where we were staying, and a mortar shell hit it and blew up all the balls. Instead of spending his military leave relaxing at home, Staubach dodged linemen at Cowboys training camp. He was like secretariat 
against a bunch of plow horses, uh, is what he was. He had unbelievable quickness. He had unbelievable change of direction. That's what made Roger great. He would feel you coming, and he would just spin out like he had eyes in the back of his head. Taking that leave to go to that training camp was the best two weeks leave I ever took. And that's when I really knew I could play football again. Just turned 27. I, I hope as a quarterback I can stay, uh, stay around longer. I might be in for a rude awakening. At Navy, the freewheeling Staubach was encouraged to improvise. In Dallas, there was a system, a system under the total control of head coach Tom Landry. Tom was an engineer. He had such belief in the system that he had meticulously devised that he kind of resented the human players getting in the way of it and screwing it up. You better be ready, I'll tell you, when you go through there, because he's going to come. He, he was a tough guy and kind of no-nonsense. Uh, you know, I was afraid of him, really. Coach Landry was pretty cautious with quarterbacks, and he didn't like to throw them out without a couple of years' experience. I look over every once in a while, see, see that he's not getting too close, but the way I look at it, though, it's my job until he takes it away because I've been there before and he hasn't. The player that, that was involved was Craig Morton, and he was a first-round draft pick and a very talented player. He took us to a Super Bowl. I didn't have anything against Craig. Mine was an age issue. After we lost to Baltimore, uh, I told Coach Landry that I'm 29 years old, and if I don't get a chance to play, I want to be traded. The next season, in 1971, Landry still hadn't made up his mind. The quarterbacks, their names are Morton and Staubach, and there seems to be some question as to which one will start. We both were playing really well. So Coach Landry announces that we're going to alternate. And we kind of looked at each other and said, man, some coach just had a, he have a stroke or something? What's going, on? What's going on here? We're going to go with this two-quarterback system, mainly because they're both executing very well. Craziest thing he ever did. Soldier Field in Chicago. I was alternating plays at tight end with Pettis Norman. And all of a sudden, now the quarterbacks were alternating plays. We get to play. You know, I run out the field. Craig's run off the field. It's like two ships passing the night. And then at the end of the game, coach kept Craig in at, in the final two-minute period, and uh, I thought I was toast. I mean, I thought my career with the Cowboys was over. Coach Landry, he called me at about 10.30. He said, uh, Craig, can you come over? And I said, sure. He sat me down. He says, Craig, he says, uh, thanks for coming over. He says, I got a feeling. I said, OK. He says, I'm going to go with Roger. Thanks for coming over. And that was it. He had a feeling. The old school coach cast his lot with the unpredictable quarterback, the escape artist, Roger the Dodger. On third downs, I used to stand next to Coach Landry because I held for extra points and field goals. And Roger would drop back, and he'd start to run, and Coach Landry would go, no, no, Roger, no. And then he'd go, 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 Roger. fit his ideal of the perfect quarterback, because I did run quite a bit. But he also saw that I would figure out how to win. Staubach looks like he might take off. Got away from one. Got away twice. Roger, you are something else. Behind Staubach, the Cowboys reeled off nine straight wins and rolled into the Super Bowl. been the most valuable player in today's game, Roger Staubach. And what a story that is. Staubach became the first player to win both the Heisman Trophy and Super Bowl MVP. Like he did with the Heisman, Staubach proved his decisions were not being shaped by football, but by family. After the Super Bowl for the MVP, instead of getting a Dodge Charger, I asked him for a station wagon. 
old Starbuck. He must be a lot of fun. Well, you know, we had three we had three kids, and we had and it had two more, so I didn't need a Dodge Charger. What are you going to do tonight? Well, my my wife and family and her family's here. We're just going to uh, you know relax, talk about it, and go to a team team function. And uh, I'm just thankful we had a successful football season. Coming up. I could not believe I'm in the same locker room with Roger Starbuck. I was in total awe of him. I just watched him how he put on his socks, his jock, and everything, man. Well, not his jock, sorry, right? <laughs> well, I was young. I was probably about seven or eight. I was in a store that had religious articles. I took a small statue of the Blessed Virgin. I didn't have any money. So I took it home, and uh, that's when I realized that was wrong. Never taken anything since. <laughs> it's all on display right here. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle. Maybe that's why I named the Hail Mary Pass after that or something. to get make up for it, but. <laughs> he actually said this in a huddle. Run a turn and take off like you did a year before on Thanksgiving Day to beat the Redskins. run it this time on the right side. Roger, he's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five. Touchdown! Would you believe it? Staubach hit Pearson on a 50-yard touchdown. So we win 17 to 14. And after the game, they just said to me, Roger, what were you thinking about when you threw the ball? And I, I just said, well, I, I closed my eyes and said, Hail Mary. I'm a Catholic kid from Cincinnati. Blessed Virgin, th thanks a lot of me anyway. I got, got her on the map, and uh, <laughs> there's always a time in our life where we need a Hail Mary. Divine intervention is tough to beat. So were the Dallas Cowboys, with Roger Staubach at quarterback. I remember thinking, if Dad is in control, we're, he, the Cowboys are going to win this game. I mean, that's, I think, what the Dallas fans thought, but I, I believed it. It's an intangible. Yeah, you can't yeah. describe it because there's just something that he has, you know, shooting a free throw. Like right now, if no you said, pressure. if you asked us, it's your dad versus Kevin Durant in a free throw competition. For one shot, you have to make one. And if you don't, you lose a million dollars. Dad. We might take dad. He told me a story, he was a when he was playing baseball, seventh, eighth grade, he was pitching and it was a tight game. When you're the pitcher, that's pretty stressful up there. And uh, he said he got in the car afterwards with his dad. Dad said, he said to him, did you like that? And he said, I loved it. And his dad said, I would not like that pressure. That drives him. It so makes him perform right. to a higher level. And, it, and it's what made him so great. He is, by God, serious about competition. Roger told Bob Hayes one day that he, he said, I'm going to beat you in a 20-yard dash. And in the men's 100-meter dash, Bob Hayes equals the meet record set in 1958. When Mr. Hayes gets going, the X-15 couldn't catch him. They ran one, and Bob beat him, and they ran two, and Bob beat him. They ran five, and Bob beat him. And they ran 10, and Bob beat him. And after about the 30th one, he beat Bob. And that was the end. <laughs> I remember one time we were having a little contest for, with a group of people were all around us, and he was going to shoot some free throws, and then I was going to shoot some free throws. And he started out, and he missed like uh, three of the first five. And then after he missed about the fourth one, which I thought we were counting, he said, uh, uh, okay, now I'm, I feel warm now. Why don't you take a few warm-ups and then we'll get started? And then, of course, when we got started, he hit 9 out of 10. You know, that's Roger. He's looking for an edge, but he's also doing everything he can not to get beat. In Roger's mind, he probably thinks he can still play today. I know he does. Bring back some memories, Roger? Yeah, I'll tell you what. I got my ankles taped. I am ready. <laughs> Even today, 40 years removed from second Super Bowl loss to Pittsburgh, whenever I see Roger, he will immediately go to, you know, I think we can, if we played him again one more time today, we can, we can beat him. Now, why don't we just get up like a, you know, a little touch football game and let's go out and let's see if we can beat him one more time. It is sort of playful, but then again, he's serious as cancer. For Staubach, if you're going to play, you should find a way to win. Oh, man, that's a nice throw right there. That was never more evident than late in games when his team needed a score. Roger has a statement that he likes to be surrounded by tea bags because they perform best when the water's the hottest. He's the kind of guy when you got in the huddle, you wanted to follow him. I mean, it's that simple. 
he would have said, run down the street to the light post and turn left or right, we would have done that. Roger uh, brought out the hero in, in all of us. Got more out of the players he was playing with than anybody else. And that's another leadership quality, where you get guys to perform up and above where they are normally capable of performing. We felt he was bigger than life. If there was something I wanted to emulate from Roger, it was really his leadership ability and his uh, way of inspiring his team. Regardless of whatever the score was, the Cowboys weren't out of it. In fact, not only did you think they weren't out of it, but you knew they were going to win the game. was at his best just when the opponents thought they finally had him cornered. 23 times he engineered fourth quarter comeback victories. Now Starbuck has to perform some kind of magic. Not really relished that moment. That moment defined Captain Comeback's career. And if the Catholic kid from Cincinnati ever needed a little extra help, well, he could always say a prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I can say the Our Father, too. You want to hear the Our Father, Our in Heaven, I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> to Skip Orr, my favorite Navy receiver and best man, Congratulations on a great real estate career, your favorite QB and best man, Roger Staubach. An autograph from Roger Staubach. Whether you're his best friend or his biggest fan, it's something special. That's in my office at the State House. I had John Mara in to visit me um, two years ago, and he saw this. And he said, you keep this in your office? You're the governor of New Jersey, and it's in your office? And I said, I love Roger Staubach. I love the Cowboys. Sorry, Mr. Mara. <laughs> I loved Roger Staubach. I wanted to talk like him and run like him. He was a hero in a way that you don't ever meet a hero or know a hero. or They're just, they're the guy that's on your wall. They're not real. And the first time I ever met him was the 92 championship game, and I went out to midfield for the coin toss, and there's Roger Staubach, the honorary captain. And I, to this day, wonder if Jimmy Johnson somehow knew that that would just throw me for a loop, which it did. I was like, you're my hero, and I, I gotta go play, but, you know, you know, it's like, who talk later? You know, it's just this awkward thing in the midfield. I actually went to one of their training camps back in, I don't know, probably 1976, 77. Got an autograph from him. He definitely was my idol. In the 1970s, it seemed like he was everyone's idol. Little kids would knock on our front door and ask for autographs when he was playing. I think the only two times it upset him was when somebody woke him up on a plane yep. and asked him in communion line. Yeah, he, he, thought that, he thought that was inappropriate. Actually, to get an autograph, all you had to do was write him. Roz Cole was his assistant back then. She helped him with the thousands of autograph requests and other pleas for help. It was so important for him to answer all of the mail. He was somebody that people looked at that not only may be able to save whatever circumstance they were in by sending money or giving advice, but got some that thought he could save the country, save the world. The most important Christmas present you can give this year may be your contribution to the Salvation Army. He did his best to help mankind. There are a lot of great moments in life, and you can share them by supporting your local United Way. And the man who wore a star on his helmet. I'm going to try to complete a 1,500-mile pass to Drew Pearson in New York. Became a star on Madison Avenue. Hut, hut, hut. How do you spell relief? I spell relief R-O-L-A-I-D-S. For millions of Americans, Roll Aid spells 100% relief. Roll How do you spell relief? Roll Aids was kind of like, yeah, that, yeah, was, that I'm was not sure. That, that was the problem. You'd be walking through an airport. Hey, Roger, how do you spell relief? And it's like, oh, boy. If the Roll Aids commercial annoyed the Staubach children, a 1975 interview with Phyllis George made them a little uncomfortable. You interviewed Joe Namath. I, everyone in the world compares me to Joe Namath, you know, as far as 
you know, the idea of off the field, he's single, bachelor swing, and I'm married and family, and, you know, he's having all the fun, and, you know, I enjoy sex as much as Joe Namer. <laughs> Only I do it with one girl, you know? There I mean, you that, go. But it's still fun. That That's wasn't horrible. necessary. It's embarrassing, and we're in our 40s. Yeah. I was a teenager. That couldn't be more embarrassing. It's like, la, 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 like your, your parents. Your parents really. shouldn't talk like that. No, he hates it, but yeah. It's, oh, but, he you know, doesn't really hate he it. Does. I don't. Well, I was kind of shocked that, you know, he just said it right out there. Everybody's trying to make him seem like this really square person that, you know, didn't have any fun. And he's like, you know, that's not me. I have fun. I just have fun with one person, my wife. Fortunately, it was the truth. <laughs> no one's got me on that. <laughs> that's for sure. And <laughs> they never will. Of course, uh, you know, we've had our fifth child since then. And I think it was that night, as a matter of fact, when it started, Amy was born <laughs> nine months from that interview. Is that right? Yeah. So it's a true statement then. <laughs> The perception was that Staubach was squeaky clean. In most films, this is the point where the skeletons come out of the closet. I guess it's the challenge of people to put documentaries together to try and find somebody to say a bad word about him, but I wish you all the best in that, in that regard. Nobody's going to find anything wrong with him because he does everything right. Staubach has no skeletons, but in reality, Captain America could be both tender and tough, a lover and a fighter. You think about, like, who would you want in your, at your back in an alley if you were ever in a tough fight? You know, I used to think I wanted Randy White, but after seeing Roger for a while, I wouldn't mind having Roger Starbuck at my back, too. I mean, he's a little, you know, a little white guy, but I believe he'd fight anybody. In 1976, Roger Starbuck did get in a fight with, of all people, his backup quarterback, Clint Longley. I witnessed it all. If I had a camera there, I would have sold it to 60 Minutes or something, because it was it was some weird stuff. Clint was my backup quarterback, and, you know, we got along great. But in 76, we got Danny White came to the team. Clint was starting to feel the pressure of Danny and Roger. You know, he knew he couldn't beat out Roger, but he started feeling the pressure of Danny pushing for that second spot. They get into an argument over an out route or something that was thrown, and Roger said something to him about it, and Clint said something to him back. And the next thing you know, Clint's feet are in the air, <laughs> and Roger's got him pinned down. <laughs> Quarterbacks. Quarterbacks don't do this, right? Using that Navy stuff on them, man, that military infantry stuff on them, man, and we never knew Roger had that in him. This guy's been to Vietnam. <laughs> you know, you, you've, been to Ab you, you've been to Abilene. <laughs> So next day, we get ready for practice. We're in the locker room getting dressed. And uh, Roger's pulling his shoulder pads on over his head. And Clint jumped off that seat and just cold-cocked Roger. Sucker punched him. And Roger hit his head on that scale, and phew, blood went gushing everywhere. And turned around like a coward and ran out the door. He was packed, ready to go. I mean, it was pre it was premeditated. Before Roger could get to the dorm, Clint was in his car riding down the street, it headed out of Thousand Oaks, and we, that's actually the last time I saw Clint Longley. The Longley incident left Staubach with some stitches. When we return, an opponent who also wanted a piece of Captain America. Whatever it was, I don't regret any of it. the Dallas Cowboys. They were called America's team, and he was Captain America. Oh, they hated it. White uniforms and Coach Landry with his hat and his suit. Roger with his perfect hair and a Heisman Trophy, scrambling around and winning games. They hated us. We want Dallas, Dallas, we hate you, <laughs> Dallas. Nowhere was there greater disdain for America's team and America's quarterback than in the nation's capital. Listen, they're a bunch of damn front runners, and, and let's come back at them. That's all they get for the rest of the afternoon. George Allen, he hated the Cowboys. The bastards can't take them. The bastards can't take them. He'd tell us, I hate those sons of guns. Those Dallas Cowboys, America's team. I can hear him right now. Roger Staubach and company. Roger Staubach, Tom Landry, Tex Ram. Washington is a very tough rivalry. In fact, I don't know of any Washington player that, that likes me at all, and there's a couple that, uh, that really go after me. Dyron Talbert's job 
was to get under Roger's skin. Roger was unflappable. Military background, buttoned up. I'm impervious to everything, unless it was Dyer and Talbert. Well, you know, just crazy little, little stuff. I probably said some things. He would challenge his manhood. He would challenge his family. Never say anything about his mother or anything like that. I think it kind of got to Roger a little bit. The only way to really get to Staubach was to beat him, which the Redskins did in the 1972 NFC Championship. Their mistake was crowing about it afterwards. All through the year, Craig Martin had been the starting quarterback. They moved Staubach, who'd been hurt, into the starting lineup for that game. And we beat him up pretty bad. I didn't have a horrible game. They beat us, and Dyron just couldn't wait to say, we're glad that Staubach was the starting quarterback. And that really ticked me off. I mean, he didn't say that before the game. So the rest of my career, you, you will not see a loss that was critical against the Redskins. If you want to check that out, by the way. The Cowboys finished ahead of the Redskins every year but one the rest of the decade. And seemingly, Dyron Talbert never got to Staubach again. You couldn't hardly sack him because he's going to throw the ball or run around. He was the best quarterback that we ever played, without a doubt. Roger going deep for Drew down the sideline. Caught the 25, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown, Dallas Cowboys. Few opponents got the better of Roger Staubach. But at times, he felt limited by his own head coach, who controlled every facet of the team. Well, it's frustrating when the man that's calling the play sometimes looks at it more as a ball control game. I, I don't look at it like that. Hey, let's break this right down there. This is going to be set up. I called plays early on in my career. Then in 73, my mother was very sick and she was dying. And uh, actually died through that season. She had pancreatic cancer. And we lost on Thanksgiving Day. His, his thinking was, Roger, I know what you're going through, and I'm going to, you know, I, I think I'm going to start calling the plays. You just execute them, and I know what you're going through. So that was the reasoning. Um, it, it's what he said to me then. Down deep in his heart, it was going to happen. I know it was a strange relationship, you know. Uh, maybe it was the odd couple, but they were good for each other, both of them. You know, it's kind of like as a parent, you can't be your child's friend, you're the parent. And he was the coach, and Roger was the player, and there was that division. But yet, the time Roger separated his shoulder in training camp, and they did surgery on him right away, Coach Landry sat with me that whole morning while Roger was in surgery. So, I mean, that's a side of him. Most people said, oh, he always just stood there with his hat on and didn't smile. But he was really caring. The other team, uh, Terry Bradshaw, gets to call his own plays, and, and here you are, a veteran quarterback, and you don't. Doesn't that bother you? I would rather call the plays. I'm, uh, I'm like you, but that's, that's not our system, and we got a great coach, and uh, we've been successful with it, so you can't argue with success. Now, let me ask Maybe you. if Grant was calling the plays, you guys might be in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I could audible, and, and I did change people on routes, and he put up with that. In the Super Bowl against Denver, I had Butch Johnson go on, go on a post route instead of an in route. We knew the safety used to hover in the middle there and not get back deep, so I just took a chance. I said, Butch, run a post, and sure enough, I dropped back, and Butch was open. off the sideline and Landry runs over to him and said, what are you doing? You're supposed to run an in route. <laughs> Here we are in the Super Bowl and we, we score, Mr. Engineer, you know, and, and he never came over to me and said a word. Good champion. Yeah. Way to go, way to go. With Staubach as his starting quarterback, Landry won four NFC championships and two Super Bowls. A brilliant run that came to an abrupt end after the 1979 season. 
I had six times when I had concussions where I was knocked out. And I had two concussions that year. How long can you take that until it starts to pay a price on you? I, I really worried about that, and I saw this Dr. Fred Plum up in New York. He said, you know, you're okay in your CAT scan, Rush, but you've had too many. So my records will show that I advise you to retire. Holy cow, I can't uh, believe this. I, uh, I am a nervous wreck. I didn't want him to retire. You know, he's my quarterback. You know, he'd probably still be playing if Coach Landry let him call his place, <laughs> you know. Coach Landry really never tried to talk me into staying. He knew the concussions were worrisome. He also knew that he had Danny White. The system uh, was successful before me, and it'll be successful without me. Of course, the nuts and bolts of the Dallas Cowboys is... Uh... <laughs> The man that wears a funny hat on the sidelines. It was sad to see him go. Sad to see him go. He made the game against them worth playing. America's team rolled on without Captain America, going to three straight NFC championships. But they lost all three. Tom Landry never did win a Super Bowl without Roger Staubach. In April of 2014, Staubach ran with the Bulls. When we return, the greatest run of his life. In 2013, Jennifer Staubach Gates ran for Dallas City Council. She's a Staubach, so she won. Many assumed that after her father's playing days were over, he'd venture into politics. If I needed a job, I might have got into politics. But... Before he retired from the NFL, Staubach began a career in real estate, and he eventually started his own company. The heart and soul of what we're doing basically is, is the service side. His first client said to Roger, I love you as a quarterback, I respect you as a person, but Roger, this is business. And Roger says, I understand that, and I'll tell you what. If, after we do the work, and you're not satisfied, you don't have to pay me. Now, if you want to give me a bonus, because I'm going to do better than you anticipate, that's your call. Roger's been blessed, but it's not by accident Roger's had success. He worked his tail off. You got to study, and you got to learn, you got to know it better than everybody else. And he did as a player, and he did when he got off the field in the business world. We need to do it, so I'll, I'll sure, uh, I'll get it done. He's an icon in the commercial real estate industry the same way he was an icon in the National Football League. We grew from one office in Dallas to, uh, you know, 30-plus offices uh, around the U.S., uh, Mexico, Canada, uh, by the time we, we sold the company in 2007. Staubach sold his company to Jones Lang LaSalle for more than $600 million. Today, he serves as executive chairman at JLL, but there are still some who wish he'd trade his corner office for the Oval Office. Oh, yeah. I'd vote for him. I would help him. I don't know how much money I would give him. I think he would have been elected for any post he ran for. I I'm surprised he didn't, and I think our country's lesser for the fact that he didn't. He could have been president of the United States. Were Roger to be in politics, he's such a black and white guy, and you need to make so many compromises that I think he would just eventually feel total frustration with the process. Staubach never made that run into politics, but in a football life defined by amazing runs, one was unquestionably the most important. The touchdown run he made against Assumption in the eighth grade. I was running a kickoff back against Assumption, and she was a cheerleader run down the sideline, so I'm gonna marry that girl. You know, so. <laughs> I did, actually, <laughs> so. The football star and the cheerleader became king and queen of the prom. And five decades ago, they married. Sometimes you a kid like, well, were you really nervous the day we got married? I said, no, this is what I wanted. I knew that's what I wanted for my life. I know I would get married again. <laughs> to her. <laughs> they love each other. They love being around each other. I think it's the greatest, the greatest gift they gave the five of us. I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about football and and that's a big part of our life, but that's not our life, you know? Our life is them. And I 
think it's such a wonderful example as we could go through our marriages, you know? You don't quit and you're committed and you love your children unconditionally. Starbuck's gifts and his unconditional love were not limited to his family. He just really believes that people are innately good. With this little help, maybe, then everything's going to be better for them. And if he can do that, then he's going to do it. James, uh, who in scripture, uh, he wasn't a coach or anything, he was a scripture person, <laughs> said, you show your faith through your works. And I, I've tried to adhere to that. And he does it without any fanfare. That's, how, that's why I don't know how many guys have come to him, because he never brags about it. You know, Roger offered me an opportunity to come work in his company, you know, and I said, well, Roger, you know, I think that's a great gesture. I appreciate that, but I want to start my own business. I want to do my own thing. And guess who was the first person to invest in that business? <laughs> Didn't even know what it was. He was there for me after my husband died. We started PPI Marketing. He helped me start that. I had a 10-year-old and a 4-year-old at the time. He wanted to make sure I had something to help raise them, get them through college and all of the rest. I was coaching at the University of Oregon and, and, and I lost my 18-year-old son. He died in his sleep. We never found out why he died. I was brain dead, completely brain dead. And Roger called me when he found that I was gonna move back to Dallas. And he said, you got an office and he gave me a salary. And he said, you don't even have to come in. You know, and he, he saved my life. He, he saved my life. Yeah, my darkest hour was in a drug rehab in 1983. No money, addicted to crack, contemplating suicide. And I called him. He said, you know, the drug screwed you up, Thomas. He said, but you're a good guy. You've always been a good guy. And I didn't know that I was a good guy at that moment. I've been sober 30 years. And I give a lot of that credit to Roger Starbuck. I love Roger. He's a friend of mine. He's everything that people think that he is, and that's, that's rare. Roger's held to such a lofty standard that it would be hard for anyone to be able to live up to that, but, you know, he does. If you were to pick the prototype, great American citizen, uh, I would say that's Roger Staubach. I think that Roger Staubach should have the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I mean, this is a guy you can go to war with. This is a guy you can win with, who is moral, practices his faith religiously. This is some special person. He's the finest person I've ever known in my life the kind of person you'd want your children to look up to in every way. And there's so few of those people in life in general, but in sports in particular. And I try to teach my children about him now. I mean, there's some folks who are, I think, similar, but there's only one Roger Staubach. Who's your favorite cowboy? Uh, Roger Staubach, definitely. People are starved for heroes. I think Roger is a person that they look to and see and say, you know, here's a person that didn't have to, but did. I think that's what keeps that star burning so brightly and will continue for many, many years. Roger Staubach has worn the star and played the part of one without seeking the fame that comes with it for more than 50 years. Staubach, hit person, what you believe in? But perhaps he shines brightest when he's surrounded by the points of light he loves the most.